Hello, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 47. Uh, today, the themes are winter is coming uh, and understanding how COVID spreads and some safer holiday ideas. Um, so, unfortunately, things are not looking good. And so this, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, I think it's Brett Greer, uh, uh, basically says that things are getting so bad we may have to consider draconian measures. And so why are they saying that? Well, if you look at our numbers in Nebraska, unfortunately, they are not good. So uh, Lancaster County, here where I am, we're up to 44 per 100,000. Douglas Sarpy County is up to 56 per 100,000. Uh, the rest of the state's actually up to 76 per 100,000. So these are very, very high rates of community coronavirus spread. So uh, this is an area where other countries actually lock down. Um, and we have rural health districts are even worse. They're 99, 107, 110, 111 per 100,000, uh, almost reaching uh, South Dakota and North Dakota bad levels of community spread. Uh, and so here we are in Nebraska, we're uh, getting close uh, up, up into this range. And this is not where we wanna be because this is where things get New York City bad. And so the levels of over 100, that's where New York City was, uh, where they had that huge overwhelming of the hospitals and the high death rate. Uh, and we don't wanna be headed to there, but if we don't make a change in the next couple of weeks, we are headed that way in Nebraska as well. Uh, the, this is part of what prompted the Journal of American Medical Association uh, two weeks ago to put this on its cover, basically a visual of how many people are dying, are going to die in, in the United States from coronavirus. Uh, you'll notice they've got a 400,000 level. That's because that's what most experts think, think we're going to be by the end of the year. And they've got rebar to add another block or two uh, because uh, IHIME ME out of Washington is predicting 500,000 by January. Uh, and so proportionally, some other things like uh, the H1N1 epidemic, 9-11, uh, Vietnam and Korean War by comparison, we're not even close. We'll probably exceed World War II level fatalities and potentially even get civil war. This is the civil war, uh, so over 600,000 deaths. So we could be hitting that, especially if the herd humanity people have their way. That's how many deaths we would have from coronavirus. Uh, still people are out there thinking this is a hoax, the deaths are inflated, and no, they're not inflated. Uh, the deaths are wrong, but they're wrong in a different direction. Uh, most people, although Johns Hopkins says we're over 230,000, most experts say we're over 300,000. And how do they know that? Well, the way they know that is that we have statistics going back decades about how many people die of all causes across the entire country, broken down by region and state, so we can predict how many people are expected to die each year. And then we know when a bad thing happens, like this is a bad flu pandemic uh, about two years ago when we had a bad epidemic, a couple small blips. This is just the first New England outbreak followed by the summer outbreak in the South. No comparison here. So yes, it's way better than influenza or way worse than influenza as far as fatalities. And now we're going to have a third wave coming up, which might be just as bad as this wave. So if you look, uh, basically we had the first outbreak in the Northeast in New York City, New Jersey. This is what caused this big spike in deaths uh, when the New York City and uh, New, York, New, York, New England was overwhelmed. Then you had to spread through Florida, Texas, Arizona, California. Uh, although the numbers were higher uh, as far as numbers of infections, the deaths were lower. And that's because it, it was mostly younger people going out to bars, uh, basically, and restaurants and things like that. So it infected a younger per population, so the death rate wasn't so high. Uh, unfortunately, the next wave is going to be more like this because it's not just a younger population. It's in rural America, which tends to be older and has more health risks than uh, other areas. And so this is going to be a population that's going to do worse uh, than the population that was infected in the South earlier this year. This little drop off at the end, it's not a drop off in death. It's because not all the death certificates in it. And there's a little disclaimer in here that data is incomplete because it takes a few weeks for those death certificates to make it to the simple, central place where they tabulate them all. Uh, we are starting to see that in North Dakota. So North Dakota, uh, the pro other pro problem is the deaths also trail uh, the rise in rates by about a month. Uh, and so the rates of North, in North Dakota started going up about two months ago. And you're starting to see this big spike in deaths in North Dakota. And so I think North Dakota's numbers are going to look just like New York City's uh, in, in the coming weeks. And Nebraska is starting on its way up. So we need to start taking this a little more seriously because we are going to see a lot of fatalities uh, across the country. Um, it's also causing uh, capacity issues in our hospitals. And so all three of our major health systems are putting out a warning saying, please follow uh, the directive health measures. Please put a mask, please avoid confined spaces. They are not reducing elective surgeries to free up beds. Uh, however, beds is not the problem. It's not a lack of beds or ventilators. It's a lack of nursing staff and supplies that is gonna be our biggest problem with this. Uh, and not only is it a problem just because we don't have enough as the mortality rates go up, go up. So one reason the mortality rate was so high in Newling is they overwhelmed their nursing staff and supplies and we are headed toward that in the next two months if we do not change our direction.
Um, so basically, if you look for at the projections, like I've said in the past, uh, hospitalizations tend to lag infections by about three weeks. So if we look at where we were three weeks ago versus where we are now, uh, we are at 673 hospitalizations as of yesterday. Uh, if you project forward, we'll probably have uh, over 1,200 hospitalizations by Thanksgiving, uh, and also the fatalities will start going up. Like I said, the fatalities tend to lag about a month, so we were about 21 per fatalities per week. Now we're at about, 40, about 50 roughly. We'll probably be at 80 to 100 uh, after Thanksgiving as well. Uh, essentially, uh, by way of comparison, uh, highway fatalities in Nebraska kill about 250 people. We'll probably lose two in two and a half weeks uh, of coronavirus. We'll kill more people than we leave and lose in car accidents every year. So this is how bad things will get if we do not straighten out soon. Um, the other thing people, I've had people say, yeah, but the, our case failure rate's been really low in Nebraska. It's only 0.9%. Well, that's because most of our uh, infections have been in a younger population to date. However, the, the surge right now is, is moving to an older population, which will has a much higher fatality rate. And so if you are, say, 60 years old, your chances of landing in the hospital with coronavirus about 1 in 15, and your chance of dying is about, you know, 0.9%, like the average. But you have other people who are active health, otherwise uh, employed people age 70. We've had uh, a person, uh, someone I know whose father died who was 70 years old. There's a much higher fatality rate, one in eight chance of being in the hospital and a three, almost 3% 3 chance of dying. And so one of my frustrations is people saying, oh, it's just old people in a nursing home. That's about a third of the fatalities, but two thirds are actually people who are independent living, potentially employed people. And there are some fatalities happening even in younger age groups, uh, 13 people around 40, uh, 34 people around 50. And so there are some fatalities in younger people, plus a lot of hospitalization. Uh, and hospitals could get to the point of rationing. So this article about Utah actually is putting together a rationing plan in case they don't have enough stuff. Who's going to get it and who's not? We do not want to be in this uh, situation in the coming weeks. So why are we doing so much worse? It's a combination of cold weather and indoor spread. When it's colder out, people go inside, and inside is where it spreads. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, pandemic, fatigue, and anger. People are tired of this stuff. They're mad. They're frustrated. Uh, I understand it. I'm a little tired about this and angry too. However, the virus doesn't really care about what we think. It's going to do what it's going to do regardless of our fatigue or anger. And I think still we have the problem of mixed messages and a lack of leadership from our political leaders, unfortunately. And I don't know if that's going to get better or not. So solutions uh, for me, it's uh, one, an informed public, which is why I record these, and looking at what really does work. We, and the thing is we know the evidence-based interventions. We know what works. Um, we can get through this, uh, and so, uh, you know, it could be worse, so as far as the fatigue and anger, this is Andrew and Bessie Jacobson in front of their sod house. They're my great-great-grandparents that uh, homesteaded between Chapel and Oshkosh. Uh, it could be all at worst. Just think about them. They had to make it through a tough winter with no running water, no electricity, no central air, and no Netflix. Uh, it could be a lot worse, uh, so we can do this. Uh, we know it works. Uh, just like I said last time, I have a daughter who lives in Japan, and they're doing a great job in Japan. They've got their epidemic under control because almost everywhere we wear a mask, everybody knows the three C's and avoids those places. They're not having those social gatherings with lots of people inside like we are, which is the most of our spread. Um, and so Japan, their numbers of spread is way down here. Uh, I have another daughter who lives in Ireland. Ireland's had a mixed results. Ireland actually initially had a spike worse than the United States. However, they got it under control through most of the summer. Uh, when I was talking with Natalie, though, they are having rates up again. And they are, uh, they have what, you, it's not a complete lockdown. It's a partial lockdown. They have closed the pubs in Ireland for now. Uh, the restaurants are only doing takeout. People, uh, they're limiting sizes of gatherings and encourage people not to go with it. Uh, more than a couple miles from their home, uh, and it's working. So then the rates are dropping pretty dramatically. So when you put these interventions in place, they do work. So the question is, where and when will we get there? Um, and the other thing I remind people is people overgeneralize about Europe. Europe is just as diverse as the, as the United States. There are, there are countries in Europe that are doing just as bad as the, as the Dakotas. There are countries in Europe that are doing just as good as Maine. And so it's a mixed result uh, there just like it is here. So last thing we'll talk about uh, from an intervention, I think one of the things we're biggest learning learning is that there is some aerosol spread. And so a really good article, I encourage you to go through this. It's got some of the best visuals I've seen on how, how it spreads through a room. Uh, so basically comparisons, if you're in a room with four hours with no ventilation, nobody's wearing a mask in a social setting, which is most of our spread here in Nebraska, pretty much everybody's uh, uh, gonna be infected by the end of that four hours. 
put people on masks if it's for that length of time because of the aerosol and lack of ventilation even with masks a lot of people will get, will get uh, infected however if you have a decent decent ventilation and everybody's wearing a mask you might only infect one person from this person and if they're only affecting one if one person only affects one person the, the, the spread won't grow so he, this does make a difference so it's a combination of masks and ventilation uh, being outside of course is better but it's going to get harder to do because it's the winter coming uh, an example from schools. Uh, the good news is in schools is that we actually do know that the direction of spread from child to teacher is much lower than the risk of spread from teacher to child. So one thing we have to focus on is making sure our teachers aren't infected. But if a teacher is infected and, and TF talking to the classroom, they're not wearing masks, there's no ventilation. Uh, in this example, uh, roughly 12 kids would get infected by the end of a two hours in that classroom. Put masks on everybody and you decrease it from 12 to about five add just a, some ventilation and then they, they use an example of open windows. There's a lot of old buildings in Spain who may not have central heating and air conditioning like we have. Opening those windows can make a huge difference so they decrease the spread down to one per example. The good news in Lincoln uh, Public Schools, we've had some indoor air quality projects so we have three air changes per hour so it simulates uh, I think open having the windows open basically so fresh air or mechanically fresh air can make a big difference and so from a safety perspective I'm hope cautiously optimistic that we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, the question though is one more spread gets so high that even this isn't going to make a difference anymore. Uh, so again, layers of risk, uh, like I keep telling people, but it turns out you need really, you need the dis, the, the mask, the distancing, and the occupant uh, ventilation unless you're outside. We need to focus on how we're going to do this. The other thing I'd add is eye protection. A lot of doctor's offices now, because of some spread just by mask, they're actually adding eye protection as an additional thing. So if you're really worried, you might want to consider that. Lastly, about Thanksgiving. So what do health, health experts say? Uh, unfortunately, this with our late rates of community spread, unfortunately, the Thanksgiving gatherings are not safe right now. Uh, we're struggling with this with my own family. Uh, basically, hopefully, if the weather is nice, we, we might have a little bit more uh, uh, reason to have more people, but we're going to probably keep it down to five or six within our social bubble. Uh, if anybody wants to come in and travel, they probably should self-quarantine for two weeks and, and better to drive versus fly, but keep the group small. And so I'd uh, encourage you to read this article from the Washington Post. It's a bunch of public health experts saying what they're going to do for Thanksgiving. Lastly, uh, there still seems to be a lot of folks out there who think it's a good idea to go to a herd. I do not think that's a bad, good idea. There's a new uh, uh, article, uh, uh, declaration put out by the Public Health Committee called the John Snow Memorandum, basically refuting all the things that the Barrington Declaration is saying, which because that's not based on evidence. So please don't join the herd. It's not worth it. Uh, wear a mask, keep your distance, avoid the, get the three C's. Outside is better than in and wash your hands. Lastly, I'll kind of leave you with hopefully something a little uplifting. This is a, a quote from uh, Samuel Johnson's book, Rasselas, that I read in college. And for me, this, uh, for some reason, this quote, quote jumped out at me 30 years ago, and it's something I try to live my life back as best I can. Uh, there's a lot of frustration with the with election and which way is it going to go. We don't know yet. Uh, but, you know, we don't have to fix everything. Uh, we don't have to, and in this case, it's an old book, so motions of the elements or fix the destiny of kingdoms. We may not be able to do that, but it's our business to consider what we can do with those around us uh, to make ourselves happy by promoting others' people's happiness. And so I, this has uh, been an inspirational quote to me for 30 years, and hopefully this helps you to somewhat... Uh, hopefully you're, you're going to see coming out from us a big promotion on flu shots. The last thing we need is a flu epidemic on top of our, our coronavirus epidemic this year. So if you have not gotten your flu shot, please give your flu shot. Uh, the rationale, you're not just doing this for yourself. You're literally doing it for your kids, for your family. Uh, and this is the, epi the reason why we're taking this tax. So hopefully you'll start seeing this on bus ads and things like that with people in our community who are getting a flu shot. And please get a flu shot because the last thing we need to do is add more to what our hospital workers are already having to do. So hopefully this is helpful to do old episodes or Healthy Lincoln on the HealthyLincoln.org website. Uh, this is what I do for a living, so you know what I do. And of course, the disclaimer, because this is my opinion, mostly shared with these people, but not always. So hopefully this helps.